Jesus leads out in chapter 7, verse number 1 this morning, in this transition on his sermon with judge not or don't judge that you be not judged. Now, one could easily argue that Matthew chapter number 7 and verse number 1 is by far the most frequently misapplied verse in the entire Bible. Used and abused by Christians and non-Christians alike, profoundly misunderstood. You may have heard someone preface a point that they're about to make in a conversation with you by saying, now, I don't judge, but then they proceed to judge, right? Another common saying you've heard is, now, you do you, I'll do me. You know, in society, there's a rhetoric of this non-confrontational tolerance and acceptance that is hailed as supreme among the moral virtues. There is actually a hostility, and we sense it, toward anyone willing to speak out in disapproval of anything. That to them is deemed as hateful. We live in a society, church, you know this to be the case, where every man does that which is right in his own eyes. Where people insist that there are no moral absolutes, that each man or woman should decide for himself or herself what is right and wrong, and that we should tolerate, which in their, uh, by their definition essentially means celebrate all views, interpretations, and lifestyles. This worldview is influenced by philosophies like relativism that would esteem that there are no absolute truths in the universe. This is kin to postmodernism that actually uh, leads us towards moral bankruptcy, if you want to hear my opinion about it, but postmodernism that places self on the throne of all human authority. You hear this term, your truth, being thrown around. Your truth, as you esteem or define it, is superior to any other version of the truth that seeks to enslave you. One of the most widespread arguments against Christianity and against the church is, in fact, that you and I are judgy. We're quick to impose our views on others. Judgmentalism really is jumping to conclusions prematurely about others. If you were to hop on your device this morning, maybe you'll do it right now during the sermon just to fact check me. That's fine. Maybe you'll do it on your way home today. Maybe you'll, uh, you'll, you'll do it sometime this week. But if you were to get on Google and go to the search engine and type in Christians are, and based upon all of the entries that have been put in by the thousands and hundreds of thousands and the algorithms and all those things that are way above my head, Google's going to try to help you interpret what the next word should be. You would think that if we were doing our job, if we were representing the love of Christ the way that he's called us to, to do it, that the world would view us through the lens by which they would say Christians are kind. Christians are selfless. Christians are patient. But the Google search engine is affirmation this morning that some of us aren't practicing what we preach. And what you'll find that Google tries to put in that blank for you is that Christians are judgy. Now, while the fact remains that some Christians are judgy, and we'll get there in just a moment, don't you worry, there are a great many followers of Jesus seated in this room this morning, I believe, who are actually sincerely seeking to honor God's truth, to be spiritually awake and aware of the cultural drift and seeking to live out the convictions that are revealed to them in the pages of the Bible, willing to conclude that, God, that what God has said, though not wildly accepted, must and will be honored in our hearts and lives. Amen? Criticism does come in response to Christians who dare to speak out against behaviors and lifestyles that God himself judges, or in essence, that God has reached a verdict upon and God has declared them to be sinful or wrong. I want to just remind you and encourage you this morning, church, that the truth is the power of sin 
whether in the life of an unbeliever or in the life of a believer, is opposed to righteousness and will always resist God's absolute truth and definition of human morality. Jesus' life message itself is a controversial and objective message in a world that rejects him or any other absolutes for that matter. Jesus declares himself to be the exclusive means of salvation, the exclusive path to eternal life, the exclusive author of righteousness or righteous living. He says things like this in John chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He says, without me, you can do nothing. He says, your human attempts at righteousness in comparison to God's metric for measuring it is like filthy rags. Now that's objective. We who believe and obey the words of Jesus and take literally the life application intent of Scripture, which that's the point, right? We don't just come here each week to hear it, and we don't want, want it to just go in one ear and out the other, but we want to apply it to our lives. We who take literally this life application intent of Scripture, we will undoubtedly find condemnation towards that decision, and that's okay. This is not a new age phenomenon this has been a reality for Christ's followers of all generations. When Jesus started today's passage by saying, judge not, Jesus was not advocating a hands-off approach. We're going somewhere this morning. Stay with me. He was not advocating a hands-off approach to moral accountability, refusing to allow anyone to make any moral judgment in any sense. This command from Jesus is not prohibition against using good judgment or discernment or wisdom or even boldness in our faith and in our Christian worldview. If it were, Jesus would have actually been contradicting himself where later on in this very same chapter, in this very same sermon, likely within just a few moments, there on the mountain looking over the Sea of Galilee in verse number 19 of chapter 7 of Matthew, he says this, he says that people are actually like fruit-bearing trees, okay? And he says, by your fruits, you will know them. And so that assumes that our eyes are open and that we can discern and, 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 and make a good judgment in the right context towards the fruit that we see in other people's lives. There's an evidence there that we simply cannot ignore. And the Bible does insist that those of us created in the image of God are morally responsible to God and to one another. Someone once wrote, and I agree, to use the phrase do not judge as a means of dismissing oneself uh, from divine or moral authority is actually misappropriating what Jesus was saying. It's as though Jesus gave this command fully understanding that we were going to make judgments about things, right? But Jesus is describing how to approach these tendencies in a way that two things, number one, honors God, and then number two is loving towards other people that he knows that we're going to interact with. He wants us to be discerning and wise, but there's a, there's a stark difference between an approach of discernment and humility and wisdom than to condemnation. The word judge here actually comes in this text from the Greek word katakrino, meaning to condemn. While discernment comes from the Greek word krino, which means to separate, to see clearly, so we can disassociate the sin from the sinner. And that is not what the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the self-righteous, arrogant hypocrites that Jesus was addressing this sermon to were doing. They were simply casting condemnation. Let's just real quick talk about how we can discern between what is discernment and what is judgment. I'll, I'll, I'll put it to you in a, maybe in a, a relatable uh, way today. Perhaps on your way in this morning, you notice someone parked right next to you who is driving a brand new car. How many of you love that new car smell? Amen. I wonder if when we get to heaven, that'll be like the aroma that hits us first, right? depending on which auto manufacturer you work for, they have their own distinctive smells, right? But discernment would say this, wow, that car is a lot nicer than the one I'm driving. 
And you know, I bet it costs more every month to operate it as well. Clearly, that person, whoever it is that's driving that car, has structured their life and budgetary practices in such a way that they are able to provide that nice vehicle for their family. What a blessing that is. You know, I've actually been thinking about getting a new car and seeing this one reminds me of that. I, I wonder what practical measures I could take to be a better steward of my own resources to be able to make a new car or a new car payment or a purchase possible within my means. Perhaps you give it some thought and then you realize, yeah, that, you know, that's definitely more of a want than it is a need in my life. And I'm not seeing it in the budget. I really have no business buying a new car right now. All right, guys, let's go to church. That would be discernment. Now, judgment would be those jerks. You know, I bet they really can't even afford that car. I wonder if one of their relatives gave them the money for the down payment or maybe even bought it for them. You know, they're all about appearances anyway. You know, if I had a cake job like that guy who gets paid so much money, I'd be able to afford a new car too. Now, I know none of you have ever done anything like that ever in your life. But do you see the difference? Now, we are all called to rightly judge in a discerning way sin, but we're not to confuse it with being judgmental. Rather than eliminating the responsibility to discern here in verse number one, Jesus was actually instead rebuking a critical spirit and a hypocritical view. We who are quick to see the sins in others, just as the Pharisees were, are unwilling to hold ourselves accountable to the same standard to which we execute upon other people. And that's what Jesus was going after. The religious leaders were oppressively judgmental. They focused on the externals, the appearances, the, the superficial. Jesus, on the other hand, was actually consumed and concerned with the heart of a man. He says in John chapter 7, Jesus says unto them, uh, judge not according to the appearance of a man. He says in Luke chapter 16, uh, Ye uh, are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. You understand the Sermon on the Mount, the intent here was actually to draw a distinction between true religion and false religion, spiritual truth and spiritual hypocrisy. Jesus went as far as to say in other passages that if you want to have a righteousness that's comparable to the scribes and Pharisees, that is not the standard to which I hold people. I actually hold to a much higher standard. I hold to the standard that God gives. In Matthew chapter 20, he says this, Jesus says this, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. If you want to live like these condescending, pharisaical, judgmental people, you're not going to heaven. Not my words, Jesus' words. He said in Matthew chapter 7, this same chapter we're studying this morning in verse number 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Some of you who are focused on the externals and think that's where the emphasis should be, you've missed the entire point of the gospel. He was going after it boldly. So Jesus was writing this to the religious leaders of his day, but he was writing it also for our edification. He wanted these words to reverberate down through the generations all the way into our ears and into our hearts this morning as well. And so how do we apply it? We'll spend a few minutes doing that and we'll be done. He says, judge not that you be not judged. Well, here's a fun fact for you. We all struggle with judgmental tendencies towards other people, don't we? Usually, most of the people that I know have an opinion about most of the other people in their life. Just ask them. Sadly, the reality is that most of our judgments are not based on all the facts, just our limited perception, and even in some cases upon our biases. I recently heard a story of a, a man who was traveling in the mid-1900s from America to Europe on one of those transatlantic ocean liners. It wasn't Titanic. He made it. But while on board, he made his way down to his, uh, his room where he would spend the majority of his passage, and he noticed much to his chagrin that he was actually going to be making the voyage with a roommate, someone that he did not know who was in the other bunk. And he, you know, took a quick calculation of this man based upon the externals that he could perceive. And uh, he made his way up to the ship's officer's station. And he explained that 
uh, you know, he had been to his cabin. He had met the man who had occupied, you know, the other, the other portion of the room there. And judging from his appearance, he was afraid that he might not be a very trustworthy person. And so he reached into his pocket and he grabbed his gold-laden watch and he gave it to the officers of the ship and said, would you guys mind placing this in the ship's safe for the duration of the voyage? Because I don't know that if while I'm sleeping, this guy may or may not reach over and steal my watch. The purser accepted the responsibility for the valuables and remarked, that's all right, you know, no problem. We'll take care of them for you, sir. Just come check, check back in with us once we reach our port. But he said, just so you know, the other man that you're traveling with was just here about 10 or 15 minutes ago. And he left some things with us for the very same reason and on the very same premise. See, we all struggle with self-righteousness, but Jesus has a caution against it most of the judging that we do takes place in our minds, right? And then these, ta- these thoughts, when they're allowed to remain, they become a feeling. We all struggle with feeling objectively towards people that aren't exactly like us. Let's be honest. But then these thoughts and emotions eventually find their way to our mouths, usually divulging or digressing into gossip, criticism, murmuring, discrimination. You see, when allowed to linger, our unfiltered thoughts and emotions can stir within us and they can become a critical spirit. MacArthur said it this way in his commentary, the problem is that Christian responsibility is to discern, but once granted, it is readily warped into justification for harping criticism. Jesus said, hey, be careful. Verse number two, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. There are some important clarifications here. Our judgments, we must understand, don't affect God's grace and mercy towards us. Paul reminds us nothing can separate us from the love of God. Jesus was not saying the way to avoid any kind of divine judgment is to simply look the other way and have no regard for the moral constraints that others may or not be practicing. He's not saying that if you don't want God to judge you, we simply ignore the sins of others. That's not what he's saying. What he is saying is that we've got to understand we are going to reap what we sow. (laughs) Critical people typically aren't the most popular people in the building. People run away from them. We're prone to withhold uh, withhold mercy towards those who condemn and unfairly judge us prematurely, right? We see them, oh, there they come. Let's go the other way. I would never tell that person a struggle in my life for fear that they would judge me. Jesus says, hey, you want to be judgy? You're going to reap what you sow. But he also says this. I think Jesus is saying in essence that God alone reserves the right to cast judgment. He objects to and condemns the pride that presumes upon his divine right alone because he alone is the perfect and holy judge that we sang about this morning. He alone is worthy to declare someone right or someone wrong. When it comes to judgment, God rightly measures it out towards us and, and, and towards other individuals, we can count on that. And the scripture tells us plainly, the way to receive God's grace and mercy is actually to humble ourselves. And, and this verse implies uh, the way to receive God's correction, the way to receive God's judgment is to conduct ourselves in pride, in blind, blind judgmentalism towards others. We cannot see their hearts. We do not know their motives, the inner struggles, the bondage that they are in to the sinful action or addiction or habit to which we cast judgment. What is Jesus saying? Don't presume to be God. I am and you're not. He says, verse three, why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou, in verse four, say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine own eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite. Jesus describes the sin of self-righteousness using this metaphor, this word picture for us of a beam or a log that is in our own eye, blinding us and keeping us from being able to assist our brother or sister with overcoming or getting victory over a sin that's in their life, though their sin may be as tiny as a speck. This moat is like the, the, the same thing as like a speck of sawdust. How many of you ever had a little grain of sand maybe get in your eye? You, you can't even quite find it, but you know it's there and it hurts. It's very insignificant. 
And Jesus says, the sin that is in other people's hearts and lives as it relates to you is the size of a speck of dust. It is the size of a grain of sand. But the sin that you are dealing with when it comes to your responsibility with it before me is like a log that is in your eye. You can't possibly miss it. And to miss it is hypocritical. This metaphor suggests that being hypocritical is a much bigger problem than struggling, struggling with any other kind of sin. Ooh, easy, Lord. He's implying that the greater judgment is reserved for the one who has purposely overlooked his own mammoth sin while pointing out the sins of others. He says, why are you looking at them? Why are you confronting them? You've got your own problems. You've got bigger problems. I'm gonna be honest with you this morning, church. I have observed... And yes, I confess to you today that I have been guilty of practicing this same sin, even in recent days. Because, you know, we're all too commonly guilty of judging others by their actions, but then excusing ourselves by our intentions. You hear me? We know why they did that, but the reason we did it has an answer, has an explanation. We let ourselves off the hook. We're blind to our own unrepentant sinfulness. We give ourselves the benefit of the doubt and trust that our heart is the only one in the right place when we forget. The scripture tells us that our heart is desperately wicked. I know this is kind of an intense sermon, but it's something to think about. Jesus actually tells us in Matthew 22 that we're supposed to love other people, our neighbors, just like we love ourselves. In the Old Testament, we're all familiar with King David, I would assume. Prolific leader, a man after God's own heart, who was imperfect. And he committed a sin that maybe some of us would esteem as a log or a beam compared to what we're dealing with in our life. He committed adultery with Bathsheba. He took to wife another man's wife. And then when her faithful warrior husband came home from the battle, Uh, There was a cover-up, and then David actually had Uriah uh, sent out to the front lines of of, of the battlefield so that he would most certainly be killed, so he was really guilty of uh, adultery and murder. (laughs) Those seem like beams to me. And God sends the prophet Nathan to him in 2 Samuel chapter number 12, and Nathan describes to David this man who has done someone else a great disservice and sinned against someone else. We won't take the time to read all the verses. David is enraged and he says, whoever you're talking about, Nathan, he says, that man shall restore fourfold to the one he sinned against. The Bible says that David was wroth. And then Nathan takes that Old Testament bony finger that those those prophets certainly had and he stuck it in David's face and he said to David, David, thou art the man. I'm referring to your sin. You have taken a woman to be your wife. You have committed murder against Uriah the Hittite. You uh, have despised, in verse nine, the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight. You've killed Uriah. You've taken Bathsheba to wife. Therefore, the sword of the Lord shall never depart from thine house. Friends, we cannot walk in close fellowship with Jesus, much less be used of him to help surgically remove the sin in our brother's eye if we are living with unconfessed and unresolved sin in our own heart and life. The Spirit of God says to us what Nathan said to David, you have a problem. Thou art the man. Thou art the woman. Perhaps, sir, you mandate Or ma'am, you mandate or filter or make certain demands regarding what is allowed in your home as you should. You're very careful to guard what enters the eyes, the ears, the hearts, the minds of your children through the internet, through social media, through music, through friends, through various influences, and I applaud you for that. But then when you are not as cautious when the kids go to bed what you watch or you're not as demanding, you're not... uh, Uh, as concerned with your own accountability before the Lord as you are with their accountability before you were committing this same sin. 
Psalms 101 says, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. I will walk within my house with, perf- with a perfect heart. I will set no wicked thing before my eye. This do as I say and not as I do thing that we all sometimes practice is the quickest way to turn the hearts of our children away from the Lord. Their hearts will tell them that a God who isn't righteous enough to be equ- equitable with everyone is not someone that can be trusted. Suppose for uh, just a moment this morning after the service today, we finish up here in just a minute and, and uh, you go get your kids from the classrooms and you make your way back into the lobby and you're just rounding the corner there by the BBC Kids check-in station and someone that you may or may not know, just, you can obviously see they're, they're sort of having an emotional moment and they just blurt out as loud as they possibly can a four-letter cuss word. Some of you just woke up. And you're thinking, oh, he heard me, no. You d- and you're thinking, oh my soul, there are children here, you know, and I guarantee you in a church like ours, and this should probably happen, there'd be some people that would lovingly come around that, that individual and say, hey, you know, I know this is a public school. You might even have graduated from here. You might have talked like that back when you were in school here, but at least for today, this is a church, right? And we, we're not going to talk like that. There are kids within earshot. There, there are people who are here to hear from the Lord. We don't want to do that here. Suppose that very same person who came to lovingly confront that person about blurting out a four-letter cuss word this afternoon or tomorrow gets on the phone and proceeds to criticize or gossip someone else in the church. And somehow we esteem those as two very different things when the scripture says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers. I wonder if the Spirit this morning is revealing to us some of the sin of our, in our own hearts and saying, thou art the man. You know, unfortunately, much damage has been done to the testimony of Christ and the reputation of his church by Christians who say one thing and do another. It's only when we are consistently confessing our own sin and acknowledging it before the Lord and forsaking it, then, then we are qualified to be able to lovingly address the sins in the lives of our brothers and sisters in Christ and in the world around us, which we are called to do, by the way. Verse five. First, he says, cast out the beam out of thine own eye and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote from thy brother's eye. The Lord is calling us to keep each other spiritually accountable. That's why we gather. That's why we uh, invite uh, this life-on-life transparency that, that, we're, that we're pursuing as a church. We want uh, to have people uh, sharpen us and hold us accountable, protect us uh, from the destructive attempts of Satan to, to destroy our lives. We want to speak the truth and love to one another. Galatians says it this way, brethren, if, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such in one, but do it in a spirit of meekness, considering thyself lest thou also be tempted. He goes on to say, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. It's God's plan that restoration take place and that sin is confessed and forsaken and overcome using the body of believers gathered to help one another with that process. But if we're not careful, when we approach someone about their sin in a confrontational way, it can easily be perceived by that person as condemnation, right? So it's so important that we approach in humility and understanding that we're in no way superior and we're just as susceptible to committing that same sin. This wounds people when we don't function that way. As we feel the nudge from the Spirit, to challenge someone on a decision they're making or a sinful agenda we may perceive is having influence in their life. We must stop. We must put our own sinful propensities into perspective. Rather than doing damage in our fleshly reaction or our mean, agitated, critical spirit of frustration or condescension, we instead must let our love for them, our compassion, our desire to see restoration take place be our motivation. You know, the Lord is always working in my life. I don't know about you. He's trying to teach me things and to sanctify me and to conform me to his image. But how does he approach me? The holy God of the universe who has a right to come to me any way he very well pleases. How does he approach me? How does he approach you? He does it 
in grace. He does it in love. He does it in patience. And so we must follow that same blueprint. I'd also say this this morning, for some of you who are determined today to be God's agent for correction in other people's lives after you've heard this sermon. God, through his Holy Spirit, if, he, if that spirit is brought to life within them and the Lord is speaking into that person's heart, God, through his Holy Spirit, can do a way better job of revealing things to people than you and I can. I, and I would say this, we don't have any business approaching someone about a sin that we perceive in their life until we have first prayed that the Spirit of God would reveal it to them. We need to partner with the Holy Spirit in that work and then be surrendered to Him and not just take the liberty, but when we feel His bidding and we feel uh, His leading in grace and in love and in mercy and in humility, then and only then we approach. Verse number six. He says, give not that which is holy under the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under feet and turn again and rend you. If you looked back at this time, this culture, when the Bible was written, when the sermon was preached, pigs and dogs were ravenous creatures, okay? They were not breeding burnadoodles and selling them for $7,500 on their custom website, right? If there was a dog... It was very likely a wild creature. It lived uh, basically by the garbage and the refuse that, that, that others cast into the streets. These were mangy creatures. These were dangerous creatures. And, and pigs were the same way, eating garbage. In fact, the Jews were not even uh, permitted to eat pork for that very reason. And Jesus uses this strong, this strong analogy. He says, hey, be careful as you're seeking to be about this ministry of restoration and reconciliation with people. Be careful that you don't uh, approach people that in my estimation are actually dogs and swine. Wow, Lord, what is that about? Jesus points out that certain truths and blessings of our faith are not to be shared with people who are totally antagonistic to the things of God. We leave that right for God to discern that but he, the Lord says such people are dogs and swines and they have no appreciation for that which is holy, that which is righteous. And in fact, if you approach them, they are going to trample you and your words under their feet and they are gonna turn and rend you to pieces. He says, be careful about pro approaching people and helping them remove that speck or that moat. You may get bit when there's no repentance in that heart. You know, there was a violent rejection of Jesus. We think there is in America today. It's much worse in other parts of the world, and it was much worse in the passage that we're studying today. There was a violent rejection of Jesus' truth when this command was written. And I just want to encourage you as we wind it up this morning, there will be times when the gospel we present is absolutely rejected, ridiculed. Sometimes the Lord will help us in our discernment to actually keep our mouth shut and to turn away. And as Christians, speaking the truth should never, never be about us getting the truth off of our chest or returning fire with fire or trying to have a louder voice or speak over people. But our focus should be planting the seed. Follow me and we're, we're done. Planting the seed of conviction from God's truth into the soil of hearts. We must be sure the Lord is leading us to say what we may be thinking. Lord, do you want me to say that? Do you want me to plant that seed? Is the moment right? Is the soil ready to receive it? What's most important is that people see Jesus in us and not just our aggressive defense of the truth. Because that's represented or mis uh, misinterpreted as judgy and, and in reality, the great need that that person has in their heart and life goes unmet because they just assume everything Jesus has to say is like everything these people have to say. It's condescending and it's not filled with grace and love. So there's a disposition here Jesus is describing. Jesus wants to heal us and purge our hearts and minds of our critical spirits, of our presumptuous self-righteousness, of our own hypocrisy. Maybe today our prayer could be, Lord, take control of my thoughts, God. Change my judgmental tendencies into sincere compassion for people that aren't just like me, Lord. 
Lord, Lord, help me stand for the truth. Yes, but as I do, help me to stop damaging people with my negative, negative spirit and my pride. Lord, Lord, help my thoughts and yes, even my obedient boldness for you to contribute to people's restoration, not to their resentment for the things of God. May our testimony of grace and kindness point people to Jesus and not away from him. We talked about David earlier in the message who had a beam in his own eye and who committed abhorrent sins of adultery and of murder. And this same David who found a way back to repentance and humility before the Lord, just as we should, we should be defined by humility before the Lord, a grace-filled people. He says this in Psalm 51, this same David, he says, Lord, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Most of the hypocritical and judgmental people you know lost the joy of their salvation decades ago. He says, uphold me with thy free spirit. Then and only then, Lord, will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. If we want to be about God's business, we want to be partnered with the Lord in his work in the world. He's given us some strong cautions this morning regarding our judgmental tendencies. May we be a humble, grace-filled people, willing to be bold for Christ, but ready to humble ourselves in the process.